I don't know about you, but I find something deeply entertaining about fandom drama. Like the online equivalent of society gossip, it's always fun to stick your nose in other people's business and have a laugh about petty arguments over stuff that could not possibly matter in any serious capacity. As such, to commemorate my latest subscriber milestone, I've decided to dig into the annals of the Fire Emblem fandom's history and share with you all my memories of some of the silliest and farthest reaching pieces of drama I can think of. We've got ship wars, we've got trolls, we've got moral outrages, and we've got dissertation-length essays on what fictional characters get up to in bed. Now, lest you think I'm being petty and judgmental myself in inviting you all for some good old-fashioned rubbernecking, I must point out that this call is coming from inside the house. I've had my own share of participation in Fire Emblem discourse. I've even been accused once or twice of being a BNF, that is, a big name fan. Not because of my modest YouTube channel, of course, but instead based on my years as a blogger and occasional meta writer. While claims of my relevance within these online spaces can be rather exaggerated, it is true that I'm only as knowledgeable and passionate about this topic as I am because I've been involved in these communities. On that note though, before we begin, I think it's important to put the content of this video in perspective. Fire Emblem has always been a niche fandom in the grand scheme of things. This isn't a mega fandom like Super Hulock or Steven Universe or that thing where people ship Minecraft streamers and nothing that's gone down in these spaces can ever truly compare in scope to something like Miss Scribe or the John Locke conspiracy or what have you. In fact, I'll have reason to bring up relevant mega-fandoms as I recount certain pieces of Fire Emblem discourse, because the preeminence of widely popular media properties has allowed their fandoms to influence the conversations being held in smaller fandoms in a variety of ways. Typically very silly ones, but that is the nature of what we're talking about today. Additionally, I'm going to be sticking to discourse from the Western Fire Emblem fandom for this video. I've never had any direct access to the Japanese fandom, and while I'm aware of some of the biggest instances of drama surrounding the Japan-only titles, like the years-long debate over who fathered Lachesis' children, that's not going to be my focus here. I will, however, be drawing examples from all of the internationally released mainline titles, with the exception of the Shadow Dragon remake, because the majority of the conversations surrounding the DS titles pertain to their baffling game design choices and to New Mystery never getting a localization. After some deliberation, I'm also going to be skipping Shadows of Valentia, because its fandom footprint was comparably small and because I pretty much already addressed the main points there in my review of the ROM hack Sacred Echoes. Those exceptions aside, from Blazing Blade up to Engage, I'm here to share with you some of the most ridiculous drama to have ever come out of the Fire Emblem fandom. If you're looking to hear about one game in particular and you want to jump ahead, I've included timestamps in the description to help out with that. Grab a drink and get comfy now, because we've got a lot to cover. For these first few games, it's important to keep in mind what I said earlier about Fire Emblem being a niche series in the West, because that was especially true prior to Awakening. There just wasn't a big audience for the GBA and Tellius games, and I can recall back then Blazing Blade being lumped in with, and sometimes overshadowed by, similar Game Boy Advance titles like Final Fantasy Tactics and the Golden Sun games. Because of the relative obscurity of FE7, its fledgling fandom was particularly susceptible to copying trends from much larger online communities. And in the early and mid-2000s, there was one online phenomenon that dominated all others, based around a certain fantasy book series and corresponding set of movies. It's rather complicated to acknowledge now, with the author having revealed herself to be several varieties of terrible, but if we're talking fandom history, we do kind of have to go down this rabbit hole. Blazing Blade was furthermore ripe for Harry Potter parallels right from the start, enough to the point that I have to wonder if the developers hadn't, uh, borrowed certain elements from those books. There's an antagonist who wears a turban and who removes it during the climax to reveal something grotesque underneath, 
and an impossibly old Merlin-esque mentor figure who dies. I mean, in 2003 Dumbledore hadn't died yet, but that always happens to old mentor figures, so it's not remotely surprising. Most relevant for our purposes, though, both stories star three teenagers, two boys and one girl. Fandom being fandom, the burning question surrounding these characters was, naturally, which boy would the girl end up with? The Harry Potter fanbase would get a definitive answer to that question several years later, but Fire Emblem is typically not so clear-cut when it comes to romance. And regardless, in 2003, both fandoms were stuck in a similarly combative limbo over their central ship wars. Think of it as a forerunner to the Team Edward and Team Jacob stuff from Twilight, only without the deliberate marketing. It helped, too, that the dynamics of the two competing pairings were somewhat similar. On the one hand, you had a friendly and companionable relationship that was at worst kind of bland. On the other, you had a steamy pot of unresolved sexual tension just waiting to boil over, sometimes in ways that could come off as rather… violent. It was this second relationship that received more focus in both works, even in FE7 with its more restrictive parameters and explicitly player-driven approach to character relationships. Hector and Lynn get a handful of unique scenes, as well as their own music track not unlike what Ellie would and Ninian receive if you paired them up. Going a bit more, well, misogynist, you could even draw parallels between how some fans talked about the second female character in these arrangements, as both Ninian and her approximate Harry Potter counterpart Ginny were regarded by some as weak damsels in distress unworthy of being shipped with the lead character. For better or worse, Lynn was a prime subject for the not-like-other-girls mentality, and the various other Lord pairings could often be dismissed on similar grounds. Or at least they would have been if there had ever been a substantial number of people shipping Elliewood and Fiora, or Lynn and Kent, or so forth. This is not to dismiss the relevance of other trends in Blazing Blade shipping. For one thing, so-called novelizations of Lynn's story, where she winds up with the self-insert tactician, were abundant enough to become a cliché. The bulk of the discourse being narrowed down to Lynn's choice of Hector or Elliewood, however, did speak to what popular shipping discourse was like in the 2000s. If you weren't in the fandom when FE7 was current, you'd be forgiven for being surprised. Nowadays, when people talk about shipping Lynn, they're most likely either pointing out the tactician pairing as a forerunner of modern Avatar romances, or else pairing her with Florina. As for the boys, well, they both gotta have kids for Binding Blade to happen, but that hasn't stopped some fans from thinking they'd be cute together. We did take notice of gay subtext like that back when the game was current, but online fandom of the time was quite a bit more casually homophobic, and tended to think of gay pairings as wishful thinking that would never feasibly even approach becoming canon. This is where terms like Yaoi and Yuri became popular in English language fandoms alongside the ever-valuable label Don't Like, Don't Read, as ways to cordon off types of content that weren't typically well received in general fandom circles which were mostly reserved for heterosexual teen drama like the FE7 Lord pairings. Put a pin in how gay ships were viewed in fandom back then, because we'll be returning to all that a little later. In another instance of something you wouldn't consider only looking back on it now, Sacred Stones didn't get much time in the limelight back when it was released as it was quickly overshadowed by Path of Radiance. The two games were developed simultaneously and had uncommonly close release windows, and with FE9 being the superficially darker and more mature of the two, much of the fandom conversation passed over Magvell and headed straight for Tellius. Moreover, FE8 wasn't all that well regarded in the scant few months it had of being the latest release in the series. A particular note is that Sacred Stones was bashed for being significantly easier and more casual friendly than Blazing Blade, with features like grinding on the world map, 
branched promotions that allow for almost any unit to be viable, and the series first expressly labeled Easy Mode. Sacred Stone's lack of difficulty was so notorious that it quickly became common knowledge that its Jagan character, Seth, can solo the game even on hard mode. As it turns out, while Seth was off utterly wrecking the difficulty curve in-game, he was also busy shaping the modest shipping culture surrounding FE8. Many fans quickly latched onto the romantic potential of his relationship with Erica. Not terribly surprising considering some of their shippiest moments come in the game's first few minutes, but the relative lack of competition was unexpected. Erica, after all, has a whopping six paired endings, as well as her tragic relationship with Leon. And yet, almost everyone was on board with pairing her off with her devoted knight. The rapid growth of Erica Seth led to, naturally, an abundance of fanfiction. But as is often the case with major fandom shifts, a certain preferred form of Erica Seth came into fashion. Aspiring fic writers would copy the conventions and tropes of existing fics for their ship, creating a circular feedback loop of formulaic writing. Not helped in this instance by the fact that these two actually have plenty of canon material to work off, and if you look at their interactions in isolation, it's a fairly by-the-numbers princess and knight dynamic. The problem with that, of course, is that these characters don't exist in isolation with one another, and do in fact have other traits. A blogging acquaintance of mine who pointed this out back in the day came up with the title of this section as a sarcastic description of what all these fanfics were doing to Seth's character. All of his harder edges were being sanded down, and his presence reduced to the blandness of a male lead in a bad rom-com or, you know, a Disney prince. I mean, I'm not really up on my Disney lore, and I'm struggling to think of any character of theirs that would map onto this version of Seth exactly, but I understand the sentiment. Seth in canon can be rough and starkly realistic, and he's not perpetually angsting over that one time when he had to grab Erica to save her from being murdered. With the hindsight of many years behind us, it's perhaps a bit silly to care this much about characterization in a ship that came and went in popularity in a matter of months, but I believe that these stories become more interesting to retell as 2000s era fandom becomes increasingly inaccessible. LiveJournal is long dead, Fanfiction.net is now a barely usable ad-choked hellscape, and Intelligent Systems surely didn't take notice because it took them until last year to give Seth his first hero's alt. This guy truly can't catch a break from anyone. Oh my god, I am so sick of arguing about Ike. This has been going on for 15 fucking years and no one can ever let it rest. <sighs> Here we go again. If we were to measure the size and scope of online discourse by its longevity, I struggle to think of another in this fandom that surpasses the endless arguments over Ike's sexuality. Of course, there are older controversies out there, and ones that have been more heated, but something about this one particular topic and its bizarre ability to resurface every few years had to land at a space high in the ranking of the biggest or quote-unquote worst wanks that Fire Emblem has ever produced. But why is that? How is it that you could go on Tumblr or Twitter and post an image of Ike backed by a pride flag and have everyone love it, but you could go somewhere like Game FAQs or the Serenez Forest forums and hear that Ike's paired endings were just pandering to delusional Yaoi fangirls and they shouldn't even be counted anyway because nothing's explicit? Fandom is not only polarized on the subject of Ike, but calcified as well. Again, why? Now, I meant what I said in that previous clip. I, personally, am done with exploring the subtext angle with Ike. I've done it so many times, in so many contexts over the years, that I can barely even bring myself to care about the guy anymore. 
For those still interested in a deep dive into what Cannon has to say with regard to Ike's sexuality, I can think of no better resource than the veritable thesis put together by a former blog mutual no longer active in the fandom. Full disclosure, I'm referenced in there a few times, and this was written nine years ago, Jesus, but I could not imagine a more comprehensive queer reading of Ike then or now. She addresses the changes in the localization versus the original Japanese scripts, Ike's dynamic with various female characters, Ike's relationships with Soren and Ranulf in the context of previous Lord relationships in Fire Emblem, the possibility that he may be asexual rather than gay or bi, the whole Priam thing because Awakening had come out and gotten people arguing about this all over again, and perhaps most importantly for what I still want to talk about today, the significance of Ike's queerness in a broader fandom context. If you haven't read this thing, and you care at all about Ike, links down in the description. Go read it. What I want to focus on here has less to do with canon content, and more with that question about the fandom I posed. Just why is everyone so polarized on this subject? I believe it's important to keep in mind here that not many people have actually played the Tellius games. They're harder to emulate than the handheld games. You're going to have to shell out a ton of money if you want to buy them, and it seems that Nintendo has no interest in re-releasing or remastering them anytime soon. Combined with the knowledge that Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn had abysmal sales numbers owing to a variety of factors, we're left with the conclusion that no other games in the series are more deserving of the title Cult Classic. There are indeed fans who played them and still have fond memories of the setting over 15 years later, but far more numerous are those who haven't, and whose exposure to Tellius comes entirely through other media, whether that's Super Smash Bros., or Heroes, or Engage, or what have you. The result of this is that not many people who know of Ike are directly familiar with him in his own games, which enables a certain skewing of perspective. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that the active Super Smash Bros. fandom consists predominantly of straight men, as still is the case with many video game fandoms. For that audience, learning about the Fire Emblem characters on the roster might be a bit of a jarring experience. You're telling me that this tiara-wearing pretty boy has a girlfriend? and this literal child has a harem of six potential wives, but this beefy stud runs off with either an emo twink or a cat boy? Something's not adding up there. What really didn't help was that the localization of Path of Radiance more strongly plays up the relationship between Ike and Alencia, and following on the heels of the popularity of Erica and Seth in the previous game, as well as heteronormative genre conventions, there were more than a few players who, two years later, moved on to Radiant Dawn and were confused to discover that Ike and Alencia have relatively little interaction, and that Alencia finds her nightly romance elsewhere. Cue endless accusations of intelligent systems caving to the whims of Yaoi fangirls, as well as a determination to pair Ike with just about any female character he speaks to even once. Conversely, as Amelion notes in her write-up, Ike being kinda sorta potentially queer happened to hit at an important time in fandom history. Recall that the Tellius games came out before shows like Glee and The Legend of Korra popularized the notion that canon same-sex relationships could become a feasible reality in mainstream media. Looking at video games, we were still a few years away from the first Mass Effect and Dragon Age Origins bringing bisexual romance options to AAA games. If you were looking for definitive video game queer content in 2005, you had... The Sims, pretty much? Ike's relationships with Soren and Ranulf maybe contain the subtext, and the Ike-Soren pairing in particular partakes of some of the stereotypical conventions of Yaoi and thus may not seem all that revolutionary when viewed through a modern lens. Still though, those ships were important, 
and I think for that reason, I'm not surprised that Ike developed a legacy as a Fire Emblem queer icon, more so than for anything that actually happens in his games. Ike broke through the glass ceiling that Lynn and Florina had previously only been able to crack, and this together with transformative fandom gradually leaving behind the open homophobia of the 2000s and earlier, led to a shift in how gay pairings were perceived in those circles. That shift was slower to take hold in the more curatorial side of the fandom which is why you'll still occasionally see confusion over the idea of people reading Ike as queer. But it's significant that that pushback against the heteronormative fandom status quo happened, even if it was never as definitive as same-sex S-ranks. In a way, Ike walked so that Corin could, um, get slammed for limited and dodgy-looking same-sex options. Okay... How about so Byleth could, uh, be a silent void with recycled scripts and only the safest and laziest same-sex options? Um, okay, so how about so Alir could also have recycled scripts and get half of them neutered in localization? Progress! God, I hate avatars. Switching over to Tellius' other lord, let's talk about Micaiah. If you're at all familiar with current discourse surrounding Micaiah, you'll know that she's often accused of being, in the typically hyperbolic language of the internet, a groomer. She meets Soth as a young child, raises him like a son or a younger brother, and then goes on to marry him. And I.S. doesn't even pretend to give a damn about this because they gave the two of them a bridal alt in Heroes. By contrast, when Radiant Dawn was current, nobody was really criticizing Micaiah for that. In the very same game, Leanne marries her former babysitter. And Jill marries a man who was best friends with her father and who may very well have seen her in diapers. Fire Emblem gonna Fire Emblem sometimes. And after several localized games, the fanbase had largely gotten used to that. That's not to say that people weren't criticizing Micaiah back then, but to talk about why, we have to discuss what is debatably the most pervasive and, for better or worse, the most iconic element of 2000s fandom discourse, the Mary Sue. For those who don't know, the term Mary Sue describes a type of fictional character one that was originally associated with fanfiction, but later began to be applied to characters in published works as well. Usually designed as self-inserts by inexperienced writers, Mary Sue's are typically powerful and well-liked by everyone in the story above and beyond what would be plausible for the setting, and are frequently used as a means for the author to write themselves into romantic relationships with their favorite canon characters. Mary Sue Wank was all over fandom in the aughts. There were litmus tests. There were entire communities dedicated to full-length teardowns of the most infamous Mary Sue fanfics. And the single most well-known fanfiction ever written, My Immortal, is a classic Mary Sue piece written in such a way that to this day no one can tell whether it was created in earnest or whether it was an expertly crafted parody of the concept. Mary Sue discourse reached its zenith in the late 2000s and early 2010s, coinciding with the release of Twilight and its, um, how shall I put this, unlicensed spiritual spin-off Fifty Shades of Grey. While many, many, many people have explored the genuine issues with these works in great detail, Nearly as many have eventually come around to the conclusion that a good bit of the backlash against Twilight and Fifty Shades was just flat-out misogyny, with people being all too willing to mock women for reading and writing stories that center female characters and their romantic relationships. Along with this came the observation that characters with these traits have always been common in fiction, and that when they happen to be male, they almost never receive this level of intense and vitriolic scrutiny. That's true of a lot of superhero media, or stories with chosen ones. 
Hell, an uncommonly strong and capable self-insert figure that every non-evil character worships and who can fall in love with your fave? That's just a Fire Emblem avatar. But what does that have to do with Radiant Dawn? Well, for a number of years after its release, Micaiah was frequently accused of being one of these canon Mary Sues. Obviously not a Bella Swan type existing only to get with the hot guy, but a Sue variation nonetheless. In keeping with the reality that at least some of the opposition to Mary Sue characters came from the traditionally straight male-dominated areas of the internet, part of this grew out of gameplay discussion, because Micaiah kinda sucks as a unit. She'll never double, she'll never be able to take a physical hit, her story promotions come late, and unless you're playing on the lowest difficulty, she'll spend the second half of the game as a staff bot in a game where staff utility isn't all that relevant. This wasn't an unexpected reaction from the fan base. For example, look at evaluations of <clears throat> Pansy Wood in FE7. But with Micaiah, it became a contributing factor in attempts to delegitimize her presence in the story that she didn't deserve to be a main character when she's such a mediocre lord. Critics also pointed out many of her supposed Mary Sue traits. She has an unusual hair color that other characters frequently point out. She has a power unique within the context of the setting. She gets vague prophetic visions directing her toward plot points. She belongs to an exclusive group of people who are both powerful but also discriminated against. An almost religious cult of personality develops around her. She's the only character able to awaken the goddess sleeping in Laren's medallion. And she's eventually revealed to be the older sister of the Empress of Benyon, which together with the aforementioned cult of personality lead her to being crowned Queen of Dayan in the epilogue. Tellius truly is the girl bossiest of Fire Emblem settings. And I have to wonder if Micaiah's opposition to Ike was also baked in there as well. Like, how dare this silver-haired fanfiction trope stand against our manly, no-nonsense, god-slaying badass? He also might be gay, but we already covered why that disrupted the narrative here, so let's just move on. None of those points sound all that unusual for Fire Emblem protagonists, or just RPG protagonists in general for that matter. Even so, Micaiah was not widely liked for quite some time. We even got an early iteration of war crime discourse with her, regarding her increasingly desperate tactics in Part 3. Gradually, the pendulum did swing back a bit the other way, with more people acknowledging that Micaiah kinda gets the short end of the stick later on in the story, as she eventually has to share a body with Yune and the bulk of her plot significance with Ike who is himself disproportionately singled out as special and beloved in-universe despite being the only lord in the series with no noble, royal, or divine blood to speak of. That said, in another coincidental parallel with Twilight, fandom opinion on Micaiah didn't get to stay too positive for long, as the era of misogynistic Mary Sue allegations gave way to the broader realization of the whole grooming thing. The overall effect is essentially the same, take from that what you will, but at the very least it's more thoughtful criticism. Hasn't affected IS in the slightest, naturally, but we've already established that they are consummate masters of questionable taste. I could simply copy and paste the Awakening segment from my fan numbering video here, because it truly is impossible to overstate just how much of a watershed this game was for Fire Emblem and its fandom. Everything changed when time-traveling zombies attacked, etc. The sales numbers speak for themselves, and changes in the social media landscape in the early 2010s decentralized the rapidly growing community of players far beyond the modest fan forums of the preceding decade. All that change inevitably brought with it tension between the so-called Awakening Babies and the older hipsters who liked Fire Emblem before it was cool. Awakening itself didn't innovate many new concepts. 
Rather, it threw a whole bunch of concepts from the older games at the wall and saw what stuck. In a similar vein, the game's fandom recreated the same kinds of drama stirred up by previous entries, only now on a larger scale. There were heated shipping wars, this time with a distinctly more parasocial element courtesy of the Avatar. We got Ike Sexuality Wank 2 Priam Boogaloo, and the world was worse off for it. There was a greater scrutiny of the localization, particularly with regard to small instances of censorship compared to the Japanese version. Nevertheless, I don't believe that any one of those individual issues best exemplifies the role that Awakening played and continues to play in fandom discourse. Instead, I'd like to consider this game's legacy in hindsight, because in this one instance, it's kind of warranted. Awakening was designed as a nostalgia-laden farewell to a series that was, at the time, struggling financially and on the verge of being written off. However, much like the first Final Fantasy and its now extremely inaccurate title, the game's runaway success ensured that Fire Emblem would continue and that the series would indeed be influenced by Awakening for the foreseeable future. In particular, Awakening feels like a dry run for intelligent systems testing out the concept that would become Fire Emblem Heroes. There are themed events with special costumes, blatant fanservice characters catering to a wide range of taste in anime waifus, and a casual disregard for storytelling coherence or integrity when it might cause the player to feel bad or prevent them from romancing a particular character. Awakening even brought back units and maps from previous games, in some cases along with the now infamous practice of dressing them up in silly or sexy outfits. It's the spirit of heroes, only lacking the gotcha mechanic. Awakening also incorporated elements that would be controversial in later mainline titles. Want a dark, busty dommy mommy to step on you? Awakening's got that. Want to reach for a Red Emperor's hand? Awakening did it. Want to bang the recurring gimmick character? Awakening made her playable. Does Marth make you confused because you like him but you're not into guys? Awakening's got you covered too. And yet, for all that, how often do these aspects of FE13 get criticized nowadays, especially in contrast to everything that came after it? True, this game may be a decade old, but I posit that there's something deeper at work, and it comes down to those Awakening Babies I mentioned earlier. When we think of a Fire Emblem game's reception being colored by nostalgia, the first one that typically comes to mind is Blazing Blade. That makes sense, it was the first one released internationally after all, and being over 20 years old at this point, it's surrounded by that veneer of classic Nintendo nostalgia. But just because one game is subject to nostalgia goggles doesn't prevent others from the series being viewed through that same lens. Awakening shot the Fire Emblem fandom into the big leagues, or at least the moderately sized leagues by internet standards, but in the all-important terms of petty stuff to argue about, it didn't actually offer that much relative to other fandoms that were big in the early 2010s. Did you really think that these aggressively heterosexual anime boys could compete with the likes of Destiel and John Locke and the Onceler? Furthermore, Awakening gradually fell out of the limelight with every mainline game that followed it, except that ghost, all of which pulled the fandom in wildly different and often competing directions. Looking back at Awakening from 2023, it's become similar to the older games, where its various discourses all seem sort of… small and pointless, like arguing over Krom's can and wife because everyone ships him with male Robin these days, or wondering whether Robin is a war criminal for burning a bunch of ships when three houses in its entirety exist, or being outraged over Noe when Fates is, uh, you know, and also engages that as well. You get the idea. Maybe in another 10 years, somebody will drop a video about how Awakening sucks, actually, and almost everyone will be on board with that. Hmm, maybe I should make that video one of these days. 
I am, after all, not an impartial observer in all this, and in fact am capable of generating wank all on my own. Something to think about. Okay, we're gonna need some background on this one. Wars over characters and ships are staples of fandom, older than the internet itself. The use, and often misuse, of the language of social justice to wage these wars is relatively more recent, but still not that recent. Even in the early 2010s, you'd sometimes find opposing sides of a shipping war throwing that kind of terminology back and forth. Like, for example, fans of a gay pairing claiming that their detractors are homophobic while their opponents would accuse them of misogyny, because of how frequently Slash fandoms would sideline female characters in their quest to get their face to kiss. It wasn't until around 2016, or thereabouts, that this practice developed a label. Originally anti-shipping, then simply antis, and sometimes also referred to as purity culture after some critics observed that the moral underpinning of anti-shipping resembled the theology of certain evangelical Protestant denominations in its use of broad public shaming and overemphasis of sexual purity over all other moral concerns. In fandom terms, that of course means shipping. It's difficult to pin down exactly where anti-shipping first gained traction as a major fandom phenomenon, although I've seen accounts tying it to one of several mega-fandoms of the mid-2010s, be it Homestuck, or Steven Universe, or Voltron Legendary Defender. The shipping wars and war crime discourse and whatever else from these fandoms spread outward to encompass other communities, and unfortunately Fire Emblem was not spared. Bear in mind, too, that the mid-2010s saw another major cultural shift in online fandom, spurred on by Gamergate, a reactionary pushback against the long-delayed acknowledgement that people other than straight, white, cis men play video games and have opinions about them. Fire Emblem Fates thus released into just about the worst climate that it possibly could. I can't really blame intelligence systems for not bothering to read the room, because they are, and always have been, characteristically tasteless. But there was a lot about this game that did not sit well with people right from its Japanese release. It garnered attention as a supposedly progressive title, mostly for its same-sex avatar romances, but just about everything in Fates, including those same-sex romances, was destined to be a bombshell of discourse. There's a whole bunch of shameless fan service directed almost entirely at straight men. There's unconventional sexual content that's now even more in your face than it was in Awakening, including eight distinct flavors of adoptive sibling incest. There's an offensive Japanese stereotype about teenage lesbians that got sanded down in the most awkward way possible in the localization. There was a ton of Gamergate-flavored backlash to that same localization removing the face-touching minigame. And the antis, oh, the antis had a field day with this game. The list of problematic ships in Fates would almost be too long to keep track of. Can't ship Corrin with any of the Royals, or any of the second generation, or Azura since Revelation reveals that she's Corrin's first cousin, or any of their servants because of the power imbalance, or even either of the same-sex pairings, because Niles is a dirty-talking sadist, and Rajat is a creepy stalker and a second iteration of an already controversial character from Awakening. That's not even getting into all the other angles that people use to attack Fates, whether that was the gameplay of Birthright or Revelation, which was either too basic or too gimmicky, or the endless nitpicking of plot holes and shaky world building. Hey, did you know that this continent doesn't even have a name? Worst game ever, am I right? I feel like I'm getting a little bit off track here, though. My point was not that Fates became the entire fandom's punching bag, although that did happen. Rather, I wanted to call attention to the presence of antis here. Because if you've been watching this entire video, and not just skipping around to certain segments, I think there's a distinction to be made here that will be relevant again in the final two sections. Except for a handful of outliers, 
Prior to Fates, everyone involved in the fandom's discourse generally understood that none of this really mattered. That we were all just arguing over our opinions on video games for our own entertainment. A core tenet of the anti-shipper ethos, however, is that a person's taste in fiction is a direct reflection of their moral and political beliefs, and that people can, and should, judge others on social media based on that presumption. It goes without saying that this mentality can lead to all sorts of toxicity in the community, imbuing even something as common and pointless as a shipping war with genuine ethical weight. There's a degree of cognitive dissonance at work when trying to apply anti-logic to a franchise like Fire Emblem, and especially to Fates, because there's just so much about this game that's liable to offend on some level, but that tends not to stop anyone. There are anti-communities in the fandoms for Game of Thrones, and It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and South Park. Nowhere in transformative fandom in the last half decade or so has proven completely immune to this sort of moral brigading. Fates, as well as Heroes when it debuted in 2017, became lightning rods for drama in reaction to their objectionable content. And even in 2023, that's still essentially the case. In fact, the next mainline entry, Shadows of Valentia, would pass by largely unnoticed in part because at the time, the mobile game was already bombarding a hapless player base with horny bunny banners and beach outfits. That said though, remember that bit about using people's fictional preferences to draw conclusions about their real life politics? The Three Houses online fandom, said to be a lawless wasteland of wank, has existed for over four years. Three social media platforms have controlled the land. First are the territories of Reddit and its many subreddits, where Edelgard did nothing wrong. Beyond those moderated borders lie the blogs of Tumblr, where Dimitri create womb all for himself. Last is the beleaguered land formerly known as Twitter, where student byleth ships are weird as hell and none of you even care about the weird-ass implications. Perpetually consumed by a tempest of war and turmoil, the fandom and these three mighty websites have never known harmony. But then Tumblr outlasted the other sites. Irrefutable proof that Azure Moon is canon. Over the top that intro might have been. But I really had to set the stage here. If fate unified the fandom in criticism of a game everyone loved to hate, Three Houses did the exact opposite, and all signs indicate that this was intentional. As someone who played World of Warcraft for more years than I'd care to recount, including distinct warring factions in a game is a straightforward way for developers to ensure that their player base will feel immersed and galvanized against a concrete opponent. As Fire Emblem lacks PvP content like an MMO would have, though, Three Houses factions exclusively translated into a lot of arguing online. Without any in-game outlet to express that tribalism, the Three Houses fandom developed a serious problem with trolling and harassment that manifested in many different ways on many different fronts. That intro was an oversimplification. There weren't three fandom factions. There were more like 12, approximately. And even that's hard to say for sure, because most of these groups would temporarily ally with each other or break apart when they disagreed. And of course, above all, there's the reality that individual opinions can never be fully reduced into this basic us versus them mentality. I myself was mostly over here, but many of my blog mutuals hung out over here, and I also ship Furtibert, so sometimes it'd be over here. You get it. The battle lines could never have been clearly drawn, because that's not how fandom works. But drawn they were all the same. I ran a poll on my blog asking people how many factions they thought were active in the discourse, and while responses varied quite a bit, 
The most common answers indicated that there were more factions than simply the three or four present in the games, but that this realistically didn't matter too much, as all arguments eventually boil down to a binary opposition. Given what we see in the Fogelin games themselves, that's a fair point to make. Compounding all this, Three Houses and its spin-off slash narrative expansion pack Three Hopes released into an environment primed to stimulate literal years of discourse. Namely, a global pandemic that disrupted everyone's lives and left many of us in need of something else to focus on to distract us from real-life events. While many Switch players took this opportunity to build cozy virtual worlds for themselves in Animal Crossing, the Three Houses fanbase instead spent the first few months of lockdown fanning the fires of internet wank that, by mid-2020, might otherwise have begun to burn out a year after the game's release. Flash forward through two more years of people endlessly rehashing the same tired points they've been making since 2019, and Three Hopes arrives to kick everything back into high gear again. This, in addition to a growing sense of Fodlin fatigue and heroes that ignited fresh drama every couple of months, left many people exhausted with these games and their non-stop discourse, and fearing that it would never die. There was nowhere online you could go to escape from it either. As ever, there were mundane ship wars and opposing character drama, even more in this instance thanks to the game's factions. But these were just the tip of the discourse iceberg. Antis jumped right back into the Fire Emblem scene after their first appearance alongside Fates, this time mostly joining together under the label of anti-studentlets, fans who opposed shipping Byleth with any of the student characters in what they considered to be inappropriate teacher-student relationships. In part due to Three Houses' repetitive and easily breakable gameplay, the side of the fandom that historically spent most of their time debating stuff like tier lists and unit builds were left without much to do, leading many of them to dip their toes into transformative fandom for the first time with mixed results. Think kind of like the whole brony phenomenon, only here it was a group of predominantly straight men making their entrance into a community that had always been a haven for women and queer people and that runs off a set of rules totally different from those of curatorial fandom like you'd associate with fan wikis and TV tropes. There's no provable, objective reality in transformative fandom, which operates based on that often misunderstood principle of death of the author. As such, you can't write fanfiction and expect it to be taken as essential reading for canon that proves you supposedly understand the game better than even the developers themselves because no one's really looking at fanfiction to serve that purpose. And to talk about it that way only makes it sound like the writer didn't understand the assignment. And as much as I'm dreading it, I'm going to have to get into the politics here now. Fire Emblem has never been seriously interested in politics. Ever since 1990, it's always operated in the realm of ideologically safe, pseudo-medieval fantasy of well-meaning autocrats fighting to reclaim their thrones and their territories from obviously evil antagonists. Up until Three Houses, even for Fates with its opposing factions and mountains of other wank, fans were content to accept that hand wave, because that's the same kind of hand wave that a lot of popular historical fantasy employs to distance itself from the messier political realities of the 20th and 21st centuries. To modern audiences, or most of them, anyway. Concepts like monarchy and titled landed nobility are as quaintly outdated and nearly as fantastical as magic and dragons and neatly disappearing corpses. We understood that the reason that Fire Emblem almost always uses noble and royal protagonists is to facilitate straightforward political writing in war stories, and to make it more plausible that they be the kind of people leading armies. Even the series' sole commoner lord comes complete with a spoiler-laden backstory that reveals his lineage to be not all that common at all. Further, Ike ends Radiant Dawn by leaving Tellius, and although he's a commoner and hates nobles, 
Ike has no political aspirations of his own, and thus no desire to disrupt the continent's pre-democratic status quo. It's safe to assume that the writers felt the same way. Coming back to Three Houses, though, and things don't appear as clear-cut at first glance. There's just enough on display in this game to tease at the prospect of genuine political stakes in a multi-sided military conflict with variable outcomes. The problem is that those outcomes are all presented as happy endings for the surviving principal cast and nebulously for the continent as a whole, with the overwhelming majority of character endings varying little, if at all, from root to root. As with Ike, this gives off the distinct impression that the developers were still not interested in serious political commentary. This is reinforced further by Three Hopes, which flat out denies the player any decisive endings at all because IAS and Koei Tecmo were more concerned with not invalidating the player self-insert fantasies made possible in Houses. You heard that right, everyone. The antis were actually correct here. The core intended takeaway of Three Houses was in fact teacher-student sex all along. Edelgard's most defining character trait is that she is always, in every continuity, hot for teacher. This should come as no shock whatsoever from the company that brought us the unapologetically tasteless Awakening and Fates, and that now makes the bulk of its money off selling you TNA in a mobile gotcha. But because Three Houses doesn't wear its horniness on its sleeve, uh, most of the time, discourse rapidly devolved into all sorts of ugly, politically-minded back and forth. There have been uncomfortable parallels to World War II, endless accusations of status quo centrism, and reads of the same character that ranged from a decolonizing hero to the biggest racist imperialist of them all. In conjunction with the ever-aggressive anti-mentality, this environment produced some of the most toxic and reprehensible behavior to ever appear in the Fire Emblem fandom. People have been harassed off social media, We've had troll fix attacking and preaching to people who ship certain pairings. There have been drawn out edit wars on TV tropes in the Fire Emblem wiki. There was a YouTuber harassed into redoing one of his videos because its opinion of Edelgard wasn't sufficiently glowing. There's been all manner of fanzine drama by controlling mods. We've had, again, meta masquerading as fanfic. And sporkings of that fanfic and harassment based off that sporking. I personally have been trolled for extended periods by multiple factions involved in the discourse, and I have several acquaintances in the blogging space that have faced just as much, if not more, than me. And allow me to reiterate, this went on for years, endlessly revived by some fans who just refused to leave well enough alone and kept up with the obnoxious practice of sea lioning harassing people into debate long after they've made it clear that they don't want to engage with the topic. Now, I don't like the idea of leaving this section off on such a negative note, so I think it would be helpful to consider just why Three Houses' discourse became so noxious. Beyond the pandemic, beyond Fodlin fatigue and heroes, beyond even the live grenade of wank that was Three Hopes, what motivated the Fire Emblem fandom to be constantly at each other's throats from 2019 to now, more or less? I believe the answer lies in one of the biggest strengths of the Fodlin games, which is that they're not actually that well written. Players are bombarded with world-building details and character dialogue, but remarkably little of it actually matters to the story. Plot threads get dropped when they're no longer convenient. The heavily marketed Academy portion of the game segues uncomfortably into the series' standard war narrative. Unreliable narrators and partial information strewn across multiple routes create all kinds of inconsistencies, and the relentless similarity of the endings, or even no endings at all, destroy any sense of meaning to the player's choice of route beyond which characters they want to sleep with. The game is structured like a J.J. Abrams-style mystery box. But at the end of the day, there's not much inside that isn't just fodder for heroes' alts. All these glaring imperfections are ideal for transformative fandom, which is based on a lack of satisfaction with a piece of media and an impulse to correct 
or add to canon to address that dissatisfaction. However, because these games spread their world building so thin across multiple stories, different fans ended up wanting to fulfill that impulse in wildly different ways. Some took issue with how the periphery nations of the setting, like Almyra, are conspicuously underdeveloped in canon and are often used merely as props or plot devices, and set out to rectify that by creating their own original characters and lore based around existing ones. Others would have preferred that Three Houses actually walked the walk when it came to its politics, and wanted to envision a Fogland that could move beyond the series' medieval stasis. There was also a concerted effort to imbue the Church of Saros with traits taken from real-world organized religions, most often Catholicism because of the branding, in order to make it more actively malevolent than it actually is in the game, because there's a lot of telling and not showing on that subject in canon, and because we know that, practically speaking, the Church only exists as it does to provide an excuse for school free roam gameplay and to allow you to bang the Pope and or God. As for me, if you've watched some of my videos before or hung around on my blog, you'll know that I've been taking shots at the milquetoast implementation of Avatar romances in Fire Emblem for years now, and I find that the attempts at incorporating same-sex Avatar pairings come off as downright lazy, especially in contrast to the multiple instances of layered homoromantic subtext strewn throughout the series. Many of my videos on the Fodlin games cover just that, celebrating these relationships that exist in the writer's blind spots, but are more meaningful even if they weren't intended as such, because these characters can actually speak to one another, and I can't switch to a clip where one of them is a woman so that there can be a heterosexual explanation for this. Unfortunately, because we all have different priorities and goals when we're filling in these gaps in canon, Fans are inevitably going to come into conflict with one another when their vision of what they believe canon ought to be clashes against someone else's. If the foundation for your understanding of these games relies on vilifying Dimitri as a representative of status quo conservatism, while conversely propping up Edelgard as a revolutionary figure and probably also a lesbian while you're at it, my interpretations of Dimitri's intimate relationships with other men are not going to sit well with you. If you genuinely believe that Byleth is grooming their students by romancing them, and that anyone who supports any of the so-called student-left pairings is endorsing that behavior in real life, you're obviously going to have a problem with anyone who points out that Edelgard's teacher deciding whether or not to reach for her hand is essential to the story. I could keep going with examples, but to reach a conclusion, there are non-toxic ways to deal with differences in opinion like these. Ones that don't involve flooding inboxes and comment sections with harassment, or encouraging everyone in your echo chamber to go troll the fans you don't like. I'd like to think that I've never engaged in such behavior, at least without being provoked first. Don't feed the trolls is one of the most important rules of online etiquette but there are times when hostility must be addressed. Block, have a laugh at the absurdity of it all, and move on. And oh, how I wish I could move on, but we've got one section left, and regrettably, it's going to be in part more of the same. Fire Emblem Engage may have sparked all manner of clickbait videos and articles decrying the game as Fire Emblem just now somehow going anime, but in many respects it was really more of a return to form. Starting with perhaps the most obvious point, the gameplay is actually, uh, good again, which redirected the attention of a large portion of the fanbase that could go back to min-maxing their builds and whining about those damn casuals rewinding time and waking up to a face full of crotch and whatever else it is you do in normal mode. Additionally, Engage's tone is much more lighthearted and campy, and more consistent with what we saw out of Awakening and, by extension, Heroes. The discourse, as may be expected, followed suit, 
In place of war crimes, people went back to arguing about the relatively more low-stakes matter of whether the DLC dragons are Alir's siblings, and thus whether it's okay to ship them. Or laying into the localization for gutting the romance from half the Pactrin conversations, while simultaneously leaving the most questionable ones in the game so that the implication remained intact. Sure, for about five minutes some fans tried to make a thing out of Brodia doing an imperialism, but it's so obvious that the game doesn't care about that angle whatsoever, so it promptly fizzled out. What didn't fizzle out were the comparisons to Three Houses. This does make some sense on a lot of levels. The two games were in development together explicitly as contrasting opposites, and it seems as though nearly as many people were introduced to Fire Emblem via Houses as had been by Awakening a decade prior. And if you're only looking at these two games in a vacuum, the contrast is stark. Engage's cheesy, Saturday morning cartoon vibes and straightforward plot clash heavily against the superficially subdued Houses with its weighty political drama reminiscent of Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon. Further, Engage expects you to care about all these emblem characters from games past. And while this wasn't the first time that legacy content showed up in this series, and Three Houses itself features several scattered elements lifted from older titles, Engage is way more in your face about it, making it come off as less accessible if you're not into the whole anniversary tribute thing. That's all understandable. Different players will have different tastes in lore and aesthetics, and particularly for a series that's always been relatively niche in the West, it's a tall order to expect everyone to be invested in content from all these other games. What's less understandable, however, was the role that Three Houses' discourse ended up playing in the conversation surrounding Engage. Practically from the moment we got the first trailer in September of 2022, there formed a vocal subset of the fanbase dedicated to dumping on this game solely on the basis that it looked like it would be completely different from Three Houses. Recall, too, that this was all of three months after the release of Three Hopes, so all of that was still going on as well. Anti-engage sentiment only grew after the game came out, and we learned for certain everything that it had to offer. To the extent that it ceased to be reasonable, garden-variety discourse, and became rather more mean-spirited. There's really no other way to take fans gloating about Engage's lower sales numbers relative to Three Houses, or about Intelligent Systems playing it safer with the game's heroes representation in the first half of 2023. That was eventually rectified over the summer, with Engage seeing its first seasonal unit, as well as a second dedicated banner, but all the power-crept mobile units in the world wouldn't remove the sour taste of knowing that there was a minority within the fanbase that actively wanted the latest game to fail, that were even claiming that Nintendo was pushing out the DLC faster than usual because Engage was such a flop. In hindsight, we could probably say that Nintendo anticipated that something much bigger than Fire Emblem would be hogging the spotlight come May, so they wanted to get all of Engage's content out before then, but as with the belated Second Heroes banner, the damage had already been done. Even four years after Three Houses, and more than half a year after the next mainline installment, there were still some determined to prolong the wank over Houses, even if it meant dunking on other fans who were trying to enjoy Engage for what it was. The only exception was, of course, the same exception that Fate's Conquest got. People were, and still are, discussing the gameplay of Engage from all sorts of angles, because gameplay always gets a pass like that. While I can't say I really understand what the endgame is here, like, is anyone seriously expecting an HD remaster of Three Houses now with 50% more pointless crap to argue about? I can sort of get where it comes from. A handful of Three Houses fans, whether completely new to the series or seasoned Fire Emblem veterans, staked a majority of their online presence on picking apart this one particular game, and on discovering factions of like-minded fans and building communities around their ideas. Because the discourse became so heated and lasted for so many years, it really drove the mentality that this was something significant, 
a big important moment in fandom. How then could they look at people moving on to the next game in the series as anything other than a threat? This is especially true because Engage continually resists attempts at recreating the same types of arguments that had previously fanned the flames of Wank. The game is campy and silly, and it's fully aware of it, and there's really only so much negativity you can pull out of that beyond it being a style that doesn't appeal to you. Certainly there's some moral outrage to be generated from Engage allowing you to put a ring on a ten-year-old, but there's no back and forth there. That's just Fire Emblem being as weird as it always is. The big anti-Engage push reads very much like a desperate bid for continued relevance, and it's one that's inevitably doomed to fail. Even if IS were to create future games more in the style of Three Houses because of its greater commercial success, that would just mean that people would move on to arguing all about those games instead, especially if they have in-game factions and pretend to care about nuance and politics. Three Houses will only ever increasingly be left behind with the passage of time. If there's a takeaway to this video as a whole, it's that all discourse eventually fades. Even Ike sexuality wank, which has been bandied back and forth for over 15 years, has more or less settled down into people agreeing to disagree. You can't approach topics in media like story and characters and theming in the same way you can approach something like gameplay, which can in many cases be objectively solved. The end point here was never, this is the irrefutable 100% correct way to read this piece of media. It was, I'm bored and I want to talk about something else now. The inherent subjectivity of reactions to art and entertainment seems self-evident, but it's clearly worth reiterating. Everyone is going to have their own reactions to the same piece of media. That's what causes discourse and fandoms in the first place. But fandoms never remain static, and no one can expect to rehash the same points over and over again for years on end and not start to get on people's nerves. It's the whole sea lioning concept again. For my part, Engage may not be my favorite game in the series, but I see no reason to try to prevent other people from having fun with it just because it's not perfectly suited for me. There are other games, other media out there that I can enjoy in the meantime, and for whatever it's worth, I find Engage much easier to come back to than Three Houses, because the Fodlin games have now been so tainted by fandom toxicity that I can barely bring myself to care about them outside of my favorite ships. Also, Engage has Sami, and I've yet to see anyone online claim that they don't like Sami. So let's all play with our favorite cuddly immortal dog thing, and spend some time away from the discourse. Before you do that, though, tell me down in the comments the strangest and most memorable Fire Emblem fandom drama you can think of. Or come up with some brand new wank if you're feeling up for it. After you've done that, along with liking and subscribing and all that other YouTube stuff, you should go check out my Patreon as well. For just a small amount every month, you can support the channel while getting early access to my videos as well as longer scripts like this one and have more of a direct say in the kind of content that I make. The link is in the description, as well as on my About page. Thank you all for watching, and thank you to everyone for liking and engaging with my content. I'm looking forward to hitting my next subscriber milestone, and to whatever absurd idea I'll have to come up with to top this one. Au revoir.